You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, and any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. Ah, 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 ah. You know, you sort of walk away like, wow, that was gorgeous. (laughs) What just happened? On the Backward Compatible Halloween Spooktacular. Eric Brody and Tyler Tomaseski of Polynight Games explain their upcoming game, Inner Space. Plus, which elements are needed to create a truly terrifying game. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 14. I'm Chris, and I'm joined once again by Jim. Hi, guys. And we have a couple of very special guests with us today. We've got Eric Brody and Tyler Tomaseski of Poly Night Games. So, uh, guys, how about you introduce yourselves? Hi, um, I'm Eric Brody. I'm a co found one of the co-founders of Poly Night Games and a producer for them. I do, uh, so I'm a producer and uh, take care of all of our digital marketing. And uh, I'm Tyler Tomaseski. I'm also one of the co-founders. I'm directing this particular project. I'm also the only programmer on board right now, so that's fun. Um, Out of all the guys on the team, I guess I'm the only techie. So (laughs) Very nice. Although I get the impression that a lot of you guys are uh, a lot more tech savvy than kind of the average, you know, A-tech student here in our program. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Steve, one of our artists, actually makes shaders, so I guess that's actually much more technical than most artists yeah. around here. So yeah, <laughs> definitely. I hear uh, I hear horror stories about shaders. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll get more to your project later. Uh, but for now, um, at the time of recording, it's actually Halloween, and so uh, Jim has prepared a sort of Halloween spooky, scary themed uh, <laughs> icebreaker warm up conversation for us. So Jim, how about you tell us about that? Uh, yeah. So I wanted to make this a little spooktacular. Uh, I wanted to get that word in there. Um, (laughs) uh, So yeah, so I I, I had a little write up here and I'll try not to read it straight off, but um, you know, looking at, I was looking at scary games, scary video games and how, um, in my opinion, most of them are not really frightful outside of jump scares. Um, And I think a lot of of the reason behind that is that games really do tend to be a power fantasy of sorts and that you start out as a novice in the game and as you start to master the game systems, you, you, as you encounter increasingly more difficult challenges, uh, you become better at the game, you feel more in control, uh, your actions and the environment around you feel like they're understandable and you can control them. And because of that, unfortunately, that's kind of the opposite of what we experience when we're afraid. Uh, when we're afraid, we feel like we don't have any control, we don't understand our environment, uh, we have this sense of helplessness in the face of mystery. And uh, I think it's kind of in, in opposition to the nature of um, usually uh, what we find in video games. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, if we could explore fear in games and how we could potentially between us sort of brainstorm um, ideas of how we might design a game that could remain frightening throughout the entire experience um, but still remain, still, still be a game with objectives, not just a, a virtual space. Um, and also try to avoid just relying on the occasional jump scare. Gotcha. Hmm. I could probably talk about this for days, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I thought it was an interesting enough subject, so yeah, if you want to go right into it. Um, well, I'm actually a really big, well, we actually also just did a uh, Halloween game jam mm-hmm. recently. Oh. So um, we actually spent a lot of time during that talking about horror games and what makes games truly terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also a big Dead Space fan, which I actually don't like calling a horror game. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. an yeah. action game to me. I mean, it's I got agree. the sort of spooky elements, but it's... <laughs> well, especially the second and third. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. especially the second and yeah. third. The, the first one does a few good psychological tricks, like you hear the scary music, but you're in a well-lit room kind mm, of thing. You know, okay. and it's sort of very unsettling. Um, one of the things we did in our most current game jam, you know, you make a game 48 hours. This one, actually, I guess we had, like, 32 hours or something. It wasn't even 48. Okay. Um, is that we find, like, 
uh, there was actually like an art exhibit that did this, um, so we sort of rolled off of that, and uh, we find like slightly off things to be very off-putting, just like mm -hmm. something really subtle, just like uh, if you look at like a door frame and you normally have the four little wooden squares on it, mm -hmm. um, just one of the squares is just a little off, or you go to a table with a bunch of chairs at it and just one of the chairs is pulled out a little bit, and each of the chairs like in the game have a... Uh, Instead of going to like a flat point at the bottom, they go to like a sharp stiletto point. Okay. Um, it's just sort of everything's just a little offsetting, and to us, it's it's more disturbing than it is terrifying. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I find that as a good way to approach horror games is that instead of trying to scare the crap out of your players, mm -hmm. instead just try to make it very off-putting, mm -hmm. very just sure. like have like a steady build up of kind of like uh, this sort of tension and this kind of uncomfortableness. Yeah, it's it's more of a psychological game than it is an attempt to scare them. Yeah, gotcha. I, I actually like that. You're sort of playing with their expectations so that they're not, they're sort of put in this space where they're not really sure what to expect. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And the, yeah, just like one of the like small things we did in it even is like, uh, in the, the whole game's like a labyrinth and it's just a bunch of smaller rooms attached by doors. Um, so you keep opening the doors, you keep opening the doors, and all of a sudden, you know, one out of 20 times, you open the door, and the door sound is just disturbingly dark sounding. And mm -hmm. it's just like... It's, it's like, you, why did that one sound different? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you sort of expect a door noise, and you get something else, and it's not like, oh, you heard this really crazy loud mm -hmm. screaming sound or something. It's just the door sound didn't sound like a door sound at that time. And it's, it's just, especially if you're, like, in a dark room with a good headset, it's... Mm -hmm. It now, spooked out a lot of people, so... Now, do you think that... Because I've, I've noticed um, in games, we're sort of trained um, as long-time players of video games, that whenever we see something in the environment that is slightly different, we tend to think that there's something there to, to discover or to pick up. Mm -hmm. Like It's, it's see, interactable, yeah. Right, we think that there's some sort of inter interaction. So I assume with, with uh, the way that you're playing with the environment that you're not giving them that interaction. Correct. Um, there's one piece of interactable environment, but it's it's pretty obvious. It's a giant glowing, hovering key mm. thing, so mm -hmm. it's um, pretty obvious. I, I think um, when people notice something off, they do think it's interactable, but um, I think like if you keep your color palette consistent, so like the game is sort of f very gray throughout, mm -hmm. and the things that you can interact with pop a lot more, mm -hmm. if you keep that very consistent, um, especially if you're using reusing assets, so like in our case, um, a door might be look off, but it's still the same door. Um, and the only thing you really interact with in the game is the door. That's it. That's really it. Um, and there's sort of, I don't want to say anything else because the rest of it's sort of <laughs> a surprise, I guess. Okay. So, now, don't this, spoil it. did you make this? Um, this was for the game jam. Was this in Unity? The Unity yes. space? Or is this, okay. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a 3D game, first person uh, adventure game that we did, or a horror game, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we've actually got that on itch.io right now. Oh, so. cool. Yeah. Um, I believe we're actually going to have the link on our website like today mm -hmm. um, oh. so you can actually go out there and, and play it with our other game jam games that we have awesome oh awesome i'll totally do that later today yeah cool um yeah another uh another technique i've seen a lot of horror games is to um intentionally sort of disempower the player mm -hmm. um you make it so that the enemies are much more difficult to overcome if at all um, sometimes you can't defeat the enemies if they show up, or um, you know, sometimes they take you know sort of non-traditional routes. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think of. I haven't played a ton myself, so I'm trying to like. What do you guys think are kind of the best um, horror games as far as um, say like disempowering the player? Um, I'm not sure if it actually includes disempowering, but because I don't do a whole lot of horror games myself, I mm. am an absolute weenie when it comes to <laughs> horror, and so I stay away from a lot of them. Um, but uh, I've been watching a lot of um, playthroughs of uh, Five Nights at Freddy's recently, Okay. Um, and to me that is absolutely like the perfect horror game. <laughs> um, because on one hand, ye I know myself, and I think a lot of people find um, those those animal creatures, you know, robotic animal creatures, completely horrifying. I know that for me personally, like I never, as a child, wanted to go to a Chuck E. Cheese for that very reason. <laughs> probably even still to this day, probably would stay away from them. Um, and because there is something kind of unsettling about the absolutely um, fake eyes that you see on them, and and, mm -hmm. and and the fact that they're supposed to be so happy that you get that um, that yeah, Candy Valley. Yeah, the exactly. Candy Valley. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so then, but then even beyond that, so like even beyond just the presentation of the of the antagonists, um, the way that it deals with uh, taking power away from you as it goes on, like the the fact that you do have uh, the resource management uh, and that mm -hmm. very the very resource that you have that you are constant that you're, you're constantly losing mm -hmm. what you're supposed to used to survive yeah. um, as you go through. Um, it's a really fascinating concept and a really fascinating mechanic to I, me. I've always found it 
just watching. I'm sure there's some explanation for this somewhere. Um, it, I just find myself more annoyed at how like closing the door costs energy. <laughs> it's like, okay, why can't we just like have like doors that close and stay closed and we're do- we're good. You know? right. But then there wouldn't be a game. So it's like you gotta kind of accept that some things aren't gonna make sense. Yeah. So. Now let me let me put put this question out there too because um, your game jam game in particular I think sort of skirts another problem that horror games have at least in my opinion um, because since this game was made in such a short time period it's a it's a short game you don't really have time to um, explore the environment again and again and again and again for you know ten hours fifteen hours twenty mm-hmm. hours like you might find in a triple A game um, and I think that as you start to explore these environments, even if they are initially kind of uh, scary and freaky because you're not really sure what's there and you're not sure what's in every shadow, um, by the time you've explored it for the second, third, fourth, fifth time, it kind of loses that uh, magic and it sort of becomes routine. So do you think that that's another uh, potential way to make a game scary is just to sort of rein it in and not have it be such a long experience? Hmm. I think it's, that could help because, you know, even in something like Resident Evil, if it starts off being a little bit scary or a little bit intense, um, as you start to master the system, even if it's different from other types of games, you start to find that you um, grow more confident, more comfortable, um, mm-hmm. more able to take on whatever surprises might come at you. Um, mm-hmm. So a shorter experience, one that doesn't really let the player get comfortable, might be um, one way to make it end up, let, let them walk away from it feeling more, um, more like it was a scarier game. Yeah, um, I, I do completely agree that the because as you do play a game longer, um, you do become more comfortable with the environment, and you actually start to uh, like I memorize areas. I, um, in a blog post that we wrote this week, I talked about um, we were talking about exploration, and I was talking about uh, Grand Theft Auto Three, mm-hmm. and uh, I spent so much time in that that I I even to this day can hop in and I can tell you exactly how to get anywhere in GTA in in that Liberty City, mm-hmm. um, and so yeah, and and that that level of comfort is something that you don't, definitely don't want to. Uh, to give the player if you're trying to keep them unsettled. Um, that actually reminded me of <laughs> uh, one of my friends who told me the scariest game that he has ever played um, was Gone Home. Mm. And it was for the very reason that he didn't know anything going into that game and he didn't know that actually in reality nothing happens and that there isn't a ghost or anything. <laughs> and so he was expecting... It just looks like it's supposed to be yeah, haunted house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it totally see, and it's a perfect setup for one. Right, um, right. Because you go into the house and it's exactly how a scary movie would be set up is mm-hmm. that the family is gone, there is a mystery, try to solve it. Uh-huh. And you just expect... like. And so I played it again from that perspective. Uh, you spend the entire game by yourself with... And especially at the very beginning um, you receive those kind of cryptic messages on, on the voicemail that kind of that do put you off just the slightest bit that we find out are actually just red herrings um, and so it's uh, that was actually an interesting concept of taking something that was absolutely normal mm-hmm. um, and an environment that had nothing to scare you um, and made it actually a horrifying experience in its own right cool hmm. It's there's also other approaches to that, and I mean I hate to like talk about the game jam forever, but uh, something we actually did in there is that it's actually an iterative game, so you actually <laughs> play through the same space three separate times. I see. Um, and what happens is it's sort of this labyrinth of doors. So as the game progresses, like every single time you reset, um, so you know you go through three times, the doors stay open, and it's a giant maze. But you can use leaving doors open as a way to track the areas that you've been to. So by the third time you've played through, you've already walked through most of this place. Most of the doors are open. You feel very comfortable. On it because you're like, oh, I've been here, I've explored that, and you just sort of keep opening closed doors until everything's open, and then you've figured out the maze. Mm-hmm. By the end of that third playthrough, you, you know, it, it, the, the horror of it's gone. You know, the, you've heard the music for too long, mm-hmm. you've seen the space too much, you, you, all the doors are open, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but then all of a sudden, what we do is that we introduce something that makes all these doors that you've left open mm-hmm. something that is your downfall. Mm-hmm. So, something at the end will start chasing you. I see. And then all of a sudden... Because the doors are open. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, all these doors that have made things feel more open, more comfortable, and made the maze much more approachable and much less confusing... Close the doors, close the doors. (laughs) You close the door, you know, you're like, oh, there's a door between us, and then you realize you've opened every single door in the maze, and it's got... It can get to you any way it wants to. Nice. So... You know, not just keeping the environment fresh, mm-hmm. like that's not just a way to keep things terrifying, but another great way to keep things terrifying um, is to take something that the player becomes comfortable with mm-hmm. and then turn that tool that they've used to become comfortable in the environment and make that work mm-hmm. against them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not necessarily a great example, but something that 
I find interesting, like a, a similar example, mm-hmm. is a Fatal Frame. I don't know if you guys have played Fatal mm-hmm. Frame. Yeah, no, I have to. It's fine. I'll, I'll explain it real quick. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea of Fatal Frame is that uh, you're in a spooky haunted mansion, you know, and you you play your way through. Um, you cannot see the ghosts which are chasing you or attacking you or killing you. To see them, you have to look okay. through your camera. Oh, okay. So, oh, I've heard of this. Yes, yeah. And you take pictures of them to deal damage to them. And it's interesting be- to me, at least, because there's this environment that you can become as comfortable with it and as you want, but it's impossible to see the thing unless you go into this first-person mode mm-hmm. um, that is chasing you, which in the second you switch to first-person, the perspective's very low. It's mm-hmm. very clunky and hard to see around. Mm-hmm. Um, and another thing I even see is like with Silent Hill games is that it doesn't matter how long you're in an environment, clunky controls, and mm-hmm. I, I love this, is actually I feel like all, all horror games need nice clunky controls that are hard to use <laughs> because... It doesn't matter how comfortable you get in this environment. It's too hard to navigate it for it to be comfortable. Hmm. If it takes your character three seconds to turn around, yes, it's annoying, but the second something starts chasing you... You don't want to turn around. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter if you're not scared of the environment. It, you're stuck in it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So it, it's, to me, like a large part of making these things that the player can become comfortable with or empowered with is just taking things and making them hard to deal with or work against the player. Um, which is honestly frustrating for mm-hmm. a lot of people, which mm-hmm. is also why I think the horror genre is sort of dead, honestly. Mm-hmm. I, I actually can, I love the genre, but I consider it um, one of the two dead genres right now, which is that I think stealth games are dead, mm-hmm. and I think horror games are dead, because no one wants to play a truly good horror game where the player is disempowered, because mm-hmm. a lot of people play video games mm-hmm. feel strong. Yeah. Um, e- even uh, Metal Gear Solid, kind of a, um, a great example of like one of the leading stealth franchises out yeah. there. Um, it can be played as a shooter now. Yeah, um, they, they, Splinter Cell is even a better example with the new yeah. releases, which is just like uh, the new the new Splinter Cell games are just outright action mm-hmm. games. I love them. I mm-hmm. love the new Splinter Cell games. Mm-hmm. But they're not stealth. Well, yeah, have so. um, have either of y'all or any of y'all played um, Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem? On that the was GameCube, on GameCube, yes. right? Yeah, I, right. I've heard a lot about it. And, and what they it yeah, what they do yeah, in that here. game um, that really can can get you pretty scared. It's very interesting. Um, is they, they mess around with um, the player in terms of the, the controls themselves and also the HUD and what you think um, and what you expect that the game is supposed to be. So the game, instead of trying to make you um, afraid of the space from the perspective of a player, like for example in Fatal Frame, there's ghosts, but you as the player can't be affected by those ghosts. Um, Eternal Darkness tries to mess with things like um, the HUD of the game or take away some of your control and make your controls uh, do things that are different from what they used to do, things like that. So it's, it, it is another way to disempower the player. Um, and something that I don't think mm-hmm. that we, I really, at least I haven't really seen it in other games, um, which is kind of interesting because I remember it was, it sort of became a bit of a cult classic. It wasn't that popular when it first came out, but it's sort of gained sort of a cult following afterward. Um, so it's, it's interesting that no one's really tried to go back and re-explore that concept. That makes me think that um, a really great way to scare the hell out of a player, but probably also piss a lot of people off, would be to um, threaten their save files. Oh, that happens. <laughs> make it so the game's extremely. <laughs> make it so they're 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 they die a lot and they have to save all the time. But then, like, it's like, hey, your save file is gone now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually oh, reminds me. Um, there's actually this one. Uh, I, I don't know much about it because it's <laughs> really really new. Um, it's actually in a lot of news sites right now, so it's sort of a fresh thing. Is that um, this guy's made this game where you, the the game is intended as sort of a performance art, so he only it's only really playable when you're around him because it has externals. Ooh, cool. Um, yeah, no, you're gonna love this just because <laughs> the word performance art. So, <laughs> like, he's, it, this is the way I was reading it. I was reading it just before now. Is um, it's done with an audience, so there's mm-hmm. always people watching, and the whole thing is that you create this avatar and this pet, this cute little pet that you have in game. And then the game gives you this revolver, which obviously has no bullets in it. And the whole thing is called, I think it's called Light of the Devil. Mm. And the entire thing is that you're supposed to have this conversation with the devil on this MacBook. And the entire time the devil is trying to get you to shoot yourself with the revolver. Mm. Huh. But by extension, you sort of have this little avatar that you are in game. So you're sort of, tra- he's trying to get you to get the avatar to kill itself. Mm. Um, but the entire game is this series of questions that you have, like that you talk to with the devil, um, and there's, there's a group of people watching you. Which and so it's sort of this social experiment of like, you know, what are you? Will you tell the truth about this? You know, are you actually lying? And it's sort of this interesting thing. Like the first question it asked the player was, um, 
watching other people in pain, mm -hmm. does this bring you like joy or do you dislike this? Mm -hmm. Like that's the first, it's just all the questions are sort of in that vein of like very uncomfortable questions mm -hmm. to answer yeah, in yeah. front of a group of 20 people sitting mm -hmm. through a, you know, watching through a glass window. Um, and it's, I, I think there's so many like, you know, me like messing with player expectations, it, it, it's, I feel like like a good horror game is experimental in nature, like because it's 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 subverting expectations oh, yeah. and doing things like it's not like a triple A mm -hmm. franchise where you can just have horror game after horror game after horror game because it's just it's going to stop being scary at a point. Mm -hmm. So I feel like all horror games do something experimental, which is why indie has been doing horror so well recently. I cool. think, or at least the few of them that have, yeah, just because they I can afford to do that. Yeah, I, I actually completely agree that horror games should try to be experimental and should try to subvert player um, expectations. Um, and, this, and I find it very interesting, this performance art piece that you're talking about, because uh, something that I've noticed with, with games that are meant to be horror games, the second that you start to play them with another person, mm -hmm. as in especially a friend, um, they start to become comedy. Yeah, you start, you start, start ribbing each other. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You start laughing at everything as opposed to feeling uh, scared. So I find it very interesting that he kind of went the, the opposite way and, and made the audience an integral part of that experience. Yeah. Um, when normally, most of the time, uh, they, they want you to play this game by yourself, alone, mm -hmm. in a dark room, kind of have that solitude experience. That's, that's really interesting. Do you think that uh, horror games are best experienced in solitude? Hmm. I, I'd say it, it depends on, I mean, it definitely depends on the game, but like, yeah. like I know right. like Amnesia, the first one, actually started off with a warning saying, you know, play this in a dark room with a headset by yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember reading that and I was like, these guys know what they're doing. They're actually trying to scare me. So I waited <laughs> until I was not only late at night, 2 a.m., mm -hmm. but I waited until I was sleep deprived too. I think oh, it was like a day after a game jam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I'd say, I think in general they are. I don't know about you guys. But I think in general, games are better off alone. Just to me, it's I feel like when there's an mm -hmm. audience, it becomes it's it's more of a social thing. Well, also, yeah, because yeah. when you're around other people, um, even if they're not saying anything, if you're not joking, you feel like you kind of need to put a brave face on. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, if no one else is around, you're kind of like free to get freaked out, and you don't have to worry about what people are thinking of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, in that True. in that sense, it allows you to kind of like be swept up in this sort of horror and uh, go through that. Actually, it reminds me of um, an idea that I heard a while back, um, and maybe someone's working on this now, I don't know, it was like in a class, and I forget who um, proposed it. But at the time, uh, Nintendo had just, uh, you know, revealed their uh, their biometric little, like, mm. finger sensor, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think that's ever come out since, but I think, whatever. But their, uh, the idea was that could we use, like, biofeedback in a horror game to like design the game to like react to the player, and the idea being that they would track your heart rate, and it's <laughs> essentially like when you get more afraid, your heart rate goes up. Um, and so what, that what they were proposing doing was waiting until your heart rate was really low, like down to your normal, and then having something come out to scare you. <laughs> and then when you're afraid, you know, kind of like you know, bandage the game however you need, and then as you start to calm down, things start to calm down a little bit, and then as soon as it, your heart rate's down low again then it goes back up. Mm. Um, so it'd be interesting to mess so around with like something how, like that. How to give the player a heart attack? Is that the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Keep them in that state of really high activity? Yeah, you need a, a, really, um, a really good disclaimer before that game <laughs> right. starts. So. Oh, goodness. Well, I think this is a good place for us to go in and transition into the uh, main discussion for today, which is uh, your guys' Kickstarter. Um, mm -hmm. So the game is Inner Space, um, and you guys have been uh, doing your campaign now for, what, a week, two weeks? Um, let's see, it was last Monday, so week and a half. Week and a half? Cool. Um, it seems to be going pretty well so far, and you guys have uh, got a two-week cam or two-month campaign um, plan. Just correct. About, yeah, a uh, month and a half. Is it it's forty-six days to, to be exact. Yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Which feels like eternity in Kickstarter <laughs> land. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Especially because Kickstarter, from what I understand, is a lot of times um, the campaign needs to kind of be close by the end, but you have your biggest surge right before the end because everyone's kind of seeing like, oh, deadline, I got to pledge now. Yeah. Yeah. I've right. noticed that too. Yeah, um, we've been uh, we've been working with a few people who um, are uh, crowdfunding experts, if you will, mm -hmm. or, or just a, at least have run a number of campaigns in the past and have given us some really good advice before we before we ran in preparation and then during the actual campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to be exact as you said, uh, the 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 most important days are the very first three days and the last three days. Gotcha. And, uh, and so it doesn't really matter how long you run mm -hmm. otherwise in between. Um, and what they typically try to look for, because there's been such a community that's formed on Kickstarter, just as, just as an unique, um, 
any space on the internet, mm-hmm. communities form. Um, and because of this, uh, there's kind of certain norms that they come to expect, and uh, uh, like the serial backers, if you will, what they mm-hmm. come to expect. And yeah, um, it's, what, a, it's a weird animal. <laughs> yeah, it really, it, it, it's really been an interesting experience. Um, and and what they what they look for, what they look for, what the journalists look for, what uh, Kickstarter themselves look for mm-hmm. is uh, that you hit about like 30% at some point during your first three days. Okay. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean 10% a day for your first three days. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually, ironically, is what we ended up doing, okay. um, but uh, uh, which made for a little bit of a um, hectic and uh, concerning last day of that of that third day. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and so then that's what they look for then. And then, but you typically then make most of your money in the last three days, mm-hmm. um, which is a really, really odd, uh, creates for a really odd graph over, <laughs> over that. Um, and so, yeah, so now we're in we're in the doldrums of the middle of our campaign and um, have definitely seen it start slowing down despite doing all of the same amount of, all the same amount of marketing, mm-hmm. all the same amount of um, everything, and all, all the same community interaction, just because now we have our watchers. Now um, mm-hmm. now is when people, exactly as you said, they, they back like just a dollar or so and then spend that time watching and seeing what we're doing. And mm-hmm. um, we're, we're keeping them up to date with updates, knowing that they're watching and coming back and checking every once in a while. Right, so. right. Uh, so tell us about the game. What's the uh, what's the idea? Um, I understand that it's kind of a blend of a whole bunch of different uh, games that are well loved, and so I think when you guys have actually gotten some press coverage, I've seen on the internet, and uh, people are kind of like, so they say it's a mix between this, this, and this, and that sounds awesome. So mm-hmm. it's it's interesting to us at least because we don't we definitely don't design that way. You know, <laughs> we don't like start off with a game idea being like, well, what if we take this one and then we show it with this one? Sure, that'd yeah. be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we sort of we, we're a bit more. You know, artsy and pretentious about it. All. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the second you got to pitch it to someone, you're just like, uh, "What's the quickest way to explain this?" You're just like Shadows of Colossus, Journey, Crimson Skies mashed together, <laughs> and people just get excited. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, which is great. But, um, but uh, the game is uh, it, it sort of has the exploration elements of say like Proteus or Journey, Mm -hmm. um, with the flight mechanics of Crimson Skies, which I adore, sort of the, you have to rotate the plane and then go up and down Mm -hmm. uh, set up. um, Well, like real flying. Yeah, combined (laughs) with sort of the climaxes of Shadows of Colossus, which is sort of a few things, it's the easiest way to explain it, is Mm -hmm. from like a these are sort of the things that you are experiencing, not necessarily the like because that doesn't explain any of the details of the game. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, But it's a it's an exploration flying game um, the it takes place inside of an inverted planet. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you imagine Earth, but instead of where all the dirt is, it is air, and then where all the air is, it's dirt okay. and water. So um, gravity sort of pulls outwards instead of inwards. Mm-hmm. So everything falls away from the center of the planet, and you just sort of are in this socket of air. Um, and to me, at least, the coolest part of that is, and this is definitely not a horror game. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Is that unless you're scared of flying? Yeah, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're scared of heights. Yeah. Um, oh God, that'd be hilarious. I would, I would have loved, loved to watch a let's play of someone just terrified of flying. <laughs> or uh, I, I, I saw that you guys have underwater segments too. If you have an oxygen meter and mm. it's like I can't get to the surface, oh God. Yeah. Yeah, that could that horrify actually, some people. It's a, that would horrify me actually. <laughs> it's actually it's a pretty um, the underwater scenes get pretty scary. We sort of love the uh, like deep ocean setting. So mm-hmm. as you get deeper underwater, we do love. The like darker bioluminescent like you know jellyfishes floating around lighting up things. Cool, cool. Um, it's, it's a little scary looking, but it, mm-hmm. uh, I definitely don't think it feels scary. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, so we our goal is to sort of take. Um, we even uh, um, Eric Grossman wrote a blog post for you guys recently, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, so he even took a little bit of time, and we, we actually have another one on our own site even um, talking about what each of us find interesting about exploration and mm-hmm. sort of how we approach that as a, um, not necessarily even a genre, but sort of an element of game design. Right, right. Um, and what makes that entertaining and like what makes exploration fun in games that aren't even exploration driven games. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite analogies is Eric Brody using uh, Grand Theft Auto mm-hmm. as a reference. I actually like to use uh, Dark Souls and Dragon's Dogma as my exploration references, mm-hmm. just because those are two games that I adore mm-hmm. that I think do it well. Um, is there anything else on the elevator pitch? I guess for Interspace, there's a bunch. I could talk about it for right, an hour yeah. straight. Is the problem? <laughs> um, no, I think that you hit the main points. You did. You did mention that you do go underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do think that the dichotomy between air and water is something that we do want to try to emphasize, mm-hmm. um, just because that is is interesting. Yes, you do have a plane, but it is a submersible plane. Um, 
and I don't know if that necessarily can be seen as the uh, necessary obligatory water stage or <laughs> if there's actually a more element to that. I, I like to think the latter. Um, but it does, I think that, that the use of that is part of what made us want to really focus on exploration more among, along with other things, um, is the fact that we did have uh, this this mechanic in which you could um, submerge the plane, mm -hmm. um, which then, well, how does that uh, how does that differentiate the experience, um, and how does that um, allow you to um, uh, explore differently mm -hmm. um, based on, uh, you know, even with the same unit, if you will? Mm -hmm. So um, that would be the only other aspect because yeah. um, so we kind of talked about the 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 diving element itself, uh, the water stages or areas. Um, is it meant to be like half of the space, or is it just meant to be a small part of the space that you can also explore? Um, I think it definitely depends on which level you find yourself in. So a okay. lot of the areas are going to have a lot of deep ocean, whereas some of them are going to be sort of filled with sh more shallow water. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think ideally, because the thing is you can't very clearly see through the water, you sort of have to go there to see it, um, is that we want to very clearly indicate the water areas that you should be checking out. Because mm -hmm. um, if we sort of expect the player to explore all of the water, that's going to get... <laughs> really over the top, you know, because yeah, just yeah. as it is with yeah, Earth. Yeah, it could get tedious. Yeah, yeah. it's because most of the planet is covered in water, which means that that's going to get really <laughs> tedious really fast. Um, that being said, I am big on, like, hidden treasures and stuff, so I, I will probably just plaster little goodies across, uh, you know, sort of dead areas. Nice. Um, but I do think, uh, I was just trying to think of, um, like, one of the, like, with the dichotomy of going underwater versus being above water, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, like, demigods that you encounter that we've uh, designed is, like, sort of this almost centipede crustacean-looking thing where it's this giant crab with multiple different sort of sections to it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, like, imagery that we love is, like, a, um, you see it in a lot of, a lot of Japanese games, is, a, like, a turtle with an island built onto its shell, right. and then the rest mm -hmm. of it's underwater. Mm -hmm. And to us, like something as simple as, oh, hey, look, there's a little island over there, mm -hmm. and then you go dive underwater nearby it, and the second you go underwater, you're like, holy crap, mm -hmm. that's a that's a you know that's a turtle, that's mm -hmm. a giant crustacean, and you realize it's a living creature. Um, <laughs> and you're saying this is not a horror game. It's not, yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it's. I, I think it's definitely going to have suspense elements, um, but I don't think we're doing a lot of psychological things mm -hmm. to the player, so. <laughs> So what, what you could do to um, expand on the uh, the island on the turtle idea is have an island that turns out to be just on the top of a wart of a giant that's underwater. <laughs> and so it's even bigger than you expected. No. Very Xenoblade Chronicles. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, actually, um, I wanted to touch on the demigods thing, because I understand from what I've sort of read of your guys' stuff um, is that exploration and progression are very closely tied together. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain a little bit about how um, like exploring each area works and kind of what the objective of each area is? Um, I understand that people can kind of go at their own pace, go wherever they want, when they want, but kind of how do you beat the game, so to speak? Can I? Mm, go for it. Okay, sorry. I'm going to talk this whole time. Um, well, you're yeah. going to create a director. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> um, gosh. I, I feel a little selfish sometimes. Um, it's actually the way that we're approaching this, and I guess this might be a spoiler, um, but whatever, um, is that we want the game to be beatable mm -hmm. without having any clue what just happened. Okay. So we want you to be able to reach the ending of this game by doing all of the big things, which is sort of like see the demigod, you know, mm -hmm. do whatever with the demigod, finish that level. Okay. Um, and if you do all that, we want there to sort of be a 2011, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey esque kind of finale to this game, where you know you sort of walk away like, wow, that was gorgeous. Mm -hmm what just happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what happens, yeah, is that we have sort of these two endings that we want the player to reach. Um, one of them being the actual ending of the game, which is probably going to be very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of it is exploration, which is sort of additional. You know, we didn't we didn't want the ending of the game to be tied to how much exploring you've been done. Right. Okay. We want we want the ending to be its own thing that you just sort of could get very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we want the exploration to be a seek for, like a, a, a search for truth and for answers. Okay. So the idea is that it's a motivation in and of itself. It's just yeah. like exploring is the objective. And, and we just want sort of this exploring to be sort of finding knowledge and mm -hmm. then finding explanations. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of want the player to spend the time that even if they if they explore as they're progressing through the game, mm -hmm. they'll have the answers by the time they reach the finale. But I sort of love the idea that. There are games that don't force feed you mm -hmm. narrative, um, and instead they let you encounter them at your own pace. 
So the idea is that we're not dictating a narrative, mm -hmm. we're letting the player encounter it as they will. So if you're the kind of person that doesn't care about narrative, mm -hmm. you're probably not gonna care if you get to the ending and then don't see any, of the, see any of the extra stuff. Gotcha. If you're someone that just wants to play through that and experience the game that way, we want the player to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the the progression is that there's a very short line that is it each, reaching the ending, and there's just a bunch of spokes. Um, okay. Some people approach uh, progression design through nodes. And the idea is that sort of the node progression would be like level one, level two, level three, finale. Gotcha. And in whatever order you pick. Mm -hmm. So it's there's no linear progression to those levels even. It could be one, two, three, mm -hmm. two, three, one. Yeah, whatever. like two, three, one, and then four unlocks and you've cleared all three, that yeah. sort of thing. But, yeah. then, but then before you go to the finale that you just unlocked, you go back and explore and get all the narrative pieces <laughs> for all three, you know. And yeah, I, I'm just like having flashbacks of Mass Effect 2 right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great. That's yeah. great. And that's, um, <laughs> It's probably not in my top, but I know it's definitely in the top for Eric, and then especially for uh, Nick, mm. one of our uh, 3D artists. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to compare our game to Mass Effect, <laughs> make him very, very happy. Uh, well, he... I, um, I definitely do like, like what you're saying about letting the player sort of explore the space and letting that tell them the story if, if they're interested in the narrative. Mm. Um, so that's something that, that I, I definitely think is really needed for any sort of exploration game is that you want players to feel like there's, there's something defined, not just in terms of uh, little little extra power ups or what have you, but also that they can sort of understand a little bit more about the world through their exploration. So I, I'm really glad that you're sort of incorporating that into it. That's something that I found, find very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, uh, definitely a really key uh, reference, at least for me personally, is Proteus, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. really hit or miss with people, which is fine. Um, but something that game did really well is they made chasing a rabbit for 30 minutes entertaining, <laughs> um, which is which is great, or a frog or a squirrel. There's a bunch of different little critters. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually a few things that you can discover in that game that are very, they feel very deep. They feel mm -hmm. like there's something really beefy here. Mm -hmm. There's these little towers hidden throughout the mm -hmm. game, and there's a way to do something with them, and I don't want to spoil it for people that want to discover this. Okay. but And it feels really huge, but, you know, in the reality in Proteus, is it's... There's, it's sort of a in reality it's a bit shallow, mm. um, and I love I adore the game. But you know, you chase a rabbit for thirty minutes and you learn nothing. You figure out the <laughs> super cool thing about the towers. I have no clue what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess if you're into over analyzing art, um, then there is some beef to you know mm. some beef to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we sort of want to take these smaller interactions that the player can encounter, be it like chasing a rabbit for thirty minutes. Um, but reward that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to take something that the player inherently wants to do, mm -hmm. like explore, and then reward that, with not only with narrative, but also with in-game rewards. So like something we're doing is that when you get each of these relics that, um, so you, you find these relics in the game, they're sort of your collectible item, right? Okay. And each of them unveil a bit about the story and about the narrative in the world. And we sort of don't want them to be like, oh, this is the rock you know, that was founded by this great warrior. You know, we don't really <laughs> want to do that. We sort of want to just craft a world very naturally, okay. um, so tell it that way. But each of these relics don't just tell you more about the world, they actually give you plane upgrades. So not only do we want to incentivize, you know, sort of what players want to do and then have that uh, narrative exploration happen naturally, mm -hmm. um, but you want to take, say, like I've got friends just outright, I, I sort of hate this about them, honestly, but mm -hmm. like they just, they just don't care about narrative. They uh -huh. just outright <laughs> don't care. And I still want th the main beef of this game, which is exploring, mm -hmm. exploration to be rewarding for them. So okay. we want them to, like when they find these relics, like, oh, I got a plane upgrade, cool, I care about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, which honestly does sound a little bit like we're trying to design for you know lowest common denominator and try to hit a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's quite the case. I think well, the case. I mean, I, I think that. I mean, I, I'm sure most of us here at Backward Compatible would argue that um, it's actually a good thing to design a game with multiple play styles in mind. Yeah. Um, you know, MMOs are kind of the 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 baseline for this analogy or um, this this sort of system. Um, but there's the kind of like the five player personality types. There's like mm. the explorer. There's the achiever. There's the socializer. You know, all those. Yeah. Um, and so, if you can Talk design Bartles. Yeah, Bartles. Um, so he originally did that based on, um, I think it was MUDs, right? 
Uh, yes. Yeah. I believe so, yes. Um, he did that originally for that, and it was kind of adapted to the MMO space. But I think it applies to, you know, most games. Um, and so it sounds to me like you guys are actually doing a smart thing and trying to not just appeal to a wider audience, which is, like, smart commercially, um, but also to appeal to multiple playstyles. And there's some people that enjoy, um, you know, really getting into several aspects of a game, mm-hmm. not just, like, you know, I like achieving something mechanically and seeing a narrative, you know. Like, yeah. if, I, if I had to pick, like, if you're only going to give me one thing, give me narrative. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also like having good sort of like mechanical feedback yeah. and stuff like that. Too. And it reminds I, me of um, uh, I, I really despise it when games try to make you play the game their way. Yeah. Like a, my, my favorite, one of my favorites is uh, say in Dark Souls. Mm-hmm. A lot of the combat is designed in a way that you can fight these things any way you choose. Mm-hmm. There's often a smarter way to fight them that sort of you know gives you some sort of advantage. Mm-hmm. But let's you do it, however. Um, I think a bad example, and I might receive some flack for this, uh, I think Skyward Sword, uh, mm-hmm. at least for me personally, mm-hmm. botched combat pretty hard. Mm-hmm. In the sense that the way you, you fought this thing was that you did this, you did this, you lured it into opening this weakness, and then you hit that weakness. Mm-hmm. And it was that pattern every single time. And they made you fight things the Skyward Sword way. Okay. Whereas if you look at previous Zelda games, mm-hmm. I mean, sure, there was like a few sections like with Ganondorf where you have to hit the energy ball back and forth, yeah. back and forth, but they didn't tell you how to hit that energy ball. You can use a bottle. Mm-hmm. You can use a bottle to knock the energy ball back. So it's... <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, actually, I actually, I totally agree with you. I had similar complaints with Skyward Sword. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did want to want to ask you, because you talked about the, the relics earlier and what they tell you about, uh, about the space, and I was a little curious when the way that you phrased it, so I was going to see if I can get a little clarification. Um, is do the relics? Is this actual exposition? Is this exposition done in text or uh, voice, or is it all done visually? Okay, that's like good, how do they tell you? That's a good question. Um, okay, so ideally, when you get the relic, um, it's a visual storytelling. So, like you can look at this relic, and it's a kind of knife or something. You can try to sort of get these pieces of history and information from it by just looking at it. It's sort of a model viewer, so you can spin it around. It's like the mm-hmm. the relics in the new Tomb Raider game. You can sort of spin around and okay. look at them. Okay. Um, but the thing is, is it, and we want to design all these to where just by looking at it, you could figure out everything there is to be had in these things. Mm-hmm. So if we have some sort of like exposition that's like really like like we're just trying to tell a story here, then we'll try to do some sort of like you know visual like Egyptian style like little storyboard thing. Mm. But then what happens is there's also another character that you can go to called the archaeologist. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can bring these relics to the archaeologist, and he'll very explicitly state the significance of these relics to you. Um, and then he also gives you the plane upgrade. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to give these relics a visual storytelling where you can sort of dissect and get these yourself for people that like overanalyzing things like myself. Okay. Um, but then there's <laughs> always the player that just, like, they're just like, I, you know, I just got home from a hard work, you know, hard day of work. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to work hard at video games. I'm <laughs> yeah. here to sit back and enjoy a video game. Sure. Just tell me what this damn thing means. Cool, and, cool. So, you know, then they just go to the archaeologist and he's like, oh, hey, it means that this happened 20 years ago. Uh, cool. That, you know. <laughs> that brings me to another question then that you mentioned the archaeologist. Um, how, how populated with other characters is this world? It, I mean, it, from I'm looking at the various uh, videos and mm-hmm. it feels almost lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when when you actually make the game itself, is it meant to be very populated with a lot of different characters and, and other other flyers as well? Or are you the only kind of flyer in that space? We do sort of want the only other flying things in the game to be actual living creatures. Mm-hmm. So we sort of want you to be one of the first sets of like mechanical flying beings out there. So okay. or beings, you're you're just a plane. Some mm-hmm. people think the. I mean, I guess I won't, I, I don't know if there's a good answer to that, but um, or as far as I'm getting off topic, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Yeah, we, we definitely don't want it to be too social of a game. We don't want you talking to people a lot. Mm-hmm. So the archaeologist is definitely sort of a standout-ish situation where we did want some form of human interaction because we didn't want it to be a lonely game. Mm-hmm. We're not out to necessarily craft a, a journey experience. We're oh, not out right. to sort of have this. It's not about that. That's not mm-hmm. our, our target. Our goal is definitely to create a living universe with fauna, so like a wildlife you know, mm-hmm. these creatures and sort of mm-hmm. have these very naturalistic encounters with this world um, but to us it is actually relatively important that there are these societies of living like groups of people that are currently existing inside of this bubble mm-hmm. um, and we're actually still looking at ways that we can actually have you interact with those people maybe but I think it's it's more about the action than it is the interaction mm-hmm. and I think the archaeologist is a bit driven by necessity of needing you know, Mr. Exposition, which is your character mm-hmm. that explains the story. That's I think that's a trope. Is yes. called Mr. Exposition, the guy that explains everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
And we're actually even playing around with the idea of maybe not giving the archaeologist a face and letting, like, you know, you just go up to a ship and he radios into you. Mm. We do sort That's of We do sort of want to have a face for this character in mind, mm-hmm. but if it turns out it's the only humanoid you see, um, then that's sort of a disconnect. That You see one person, and then you're sort of supposed to imagine they're everywhere else. Gotcha. I, I will say the, the, the one benefit of having just a character visible somewhere in the game, even though it's not really about that, is scale. Mm. So, like, if you look at the game without looking at any humans, you see, you see a house, right? And it's, it doesn't matter if you really see a door. Like, it's still hard to tell how big that house is. If you mm-hmm. see a giant tower, it's how hard it's hard to tell how big that tower is because you don't know how big your plane is. You know, for all you know, this plane is microscopic. It's huge. Maybe there's 50 people in your plane for mm-hmm. all you know. Mm-hmm. So at some point, being able to see a person, or at least something that indicates the size of a person, uh-huh. does sort of help communicate scale. Um, but I, I definitely don't think it's about the interaction with the archaeologist as a person. It's definitely more about... The story that he helps explore yeah. helps the player explore, um, and I think the second that we feel like the game is becoming about that human interaction, or it feels that way at all, um, we'll find a way to fix that, or to be mm-hmm. be it add more people so it doesn't feel like he's the only one, or find a way to make him a little bit more detached so it doesn't feel like he's the only person that is just it's a little bit more you know separated. Um, that's definitely something we'll be exploring with. Something we've said a lot in the Kickstarter is. We'll work on this game as long as we need to. Mm-hmm. Our time, our, our goal is to sort of make the game in a year. Um, but if it takes us two, we'll spend two on it. Cool. You know, if we get to a year from now and we realize there's big problems with it, um, that reflects poorly on us as designers. So mm-hmm. we want to make sure that this game is bug-free when we come out. We want to make sure that if we release it for Mac, it actually works on mm-hmm. Mac. Gotcha, gotcha. It gets released on Linux, it actually works on Linux. And uh, honestly, that we just we did well in crafting an experience. Cool. So um, there's a good reason that none of us are making money off of this. So, um, yeah. um, I've actually got a question about the gameplay because um, I've seen a few videos, I've seen a few of the uh, the GIFs that you guys have posted. Um, and I noticed like one of the things you can do is like fly really close to a wall and like your wing will kind of bend mm-hmm. back and sort of scrape along yeah. and you'll just keep flying. Um, which that. raises the question for me, is the plane destructible? Is it is like you know the is survival a part of the game, or is it kind of just like you can bounce off the ground and you'll be fine and that sort of thing? Only in only in parts. Okay. Um, and so, if you were to fly directly into a wall nose first, then I would have mad. Mm-hmm. Then yes, yeah, you, you would. <laughs> it'll destroy. You. It'll either destroy you or severely damage. Yeah. You. Yeah. And then um, and then how does um, checkpointing work at that point? Okay. Um, well, I, I can get to that in just a sec. Okay. Um, but I, I did want to kind of. Uh, make sure to specify Mm -hmm. Um, part of the reason that we did make to decide on that design Mm -hmm. of being able to scrape up against walls being able to scrape against the ground Mm -hmm. is partially because it creates for these really cool scenes and this really cool feel sure Um, I think that was actually partially inspired by uh, Star Fox 64 and Mm -hmm. when you could like glide up against the water and Uh um, that's just for some reason there's something really cool feeling about Mm -hmm. that it's it's a bit of a rush yeah it's kind of like you know when you're closer to the ground it feels faster and it's exciting Uh, it feels like Top Gun yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) Um, but but I, I do like that you're not indestructible you know, yeah. because like that, like I've played a couple of flying games, like for instance on iPhone, where it's like, cool, I'm flying and this is awesome. And then it's like, I'm gonna try nose diving just for fun, and then like you just like <laughs> bounce off the ground. Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. no, like flying needs to have some risk to it. Right. You know? No, but the, also though, on that, um, we want to make sure that because we've done something cool, like mm-hmm. your wings fold when you fly nearby things, mm-hmm. we're sort of in a way encouraging the player to get close to things. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. We don't want to punish them for doing what we just encourage them to do. Gotcha, gotcha. So, mm-hmm. if you know dive under the ground, I guess it depends. We'll mm-hmm. see what, what we got balancing to do. You might bounce off the first time. Mm-hmm. If you do it again the second time in a row, you're probably going to blow up. Okay, so like you'll um, take heavy damage. It's like, don't yeah. do that again. But it's yeah. it's definitely not a survival game, and it's, mm-hmm. and it's to us, even with the demigods, um, we love these huge creatures, but it's definitely not a combat oriented game gotcha. even in that sense so um, I think it's a lot less about you know the problem is you need some sort of consequence mm-hmm. for like you know flying well and trying to teach the player to do good things right, like, right. not flying to walls 20 times <laughs> um, as of right now the way I have it in code you just sort of ricochet infinitely mm-hmm. which is hilarious <laughs> <laughs> you just fly into a corner and you just sort of ding around for 20 like for not 20 for like a <laughs> I few mean, if seconds you want to, but. <laughs> yeah, just for a few seconds and you get spit out and you're like yeah I'm fine you know uh-huh. but uh-huh. I'm still gonna make it destructible cool cool <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, well, we're going to get there. But yeah, exactly as, exactly as Tyler said, is um, if what we're trying to encourage is to kind of create a 
um, kind of more serene experience um, mm-hmm. and kind of a more peaceful experience, then the last thing that we want is for people to feel that they're constantly in danger. Um, and that's something that I know can happen very often in flying games. Sure. I think that's part of the reason that we looked at Crimson Skies is because mm-hmm. that's a, it's a flying game that doesn't punish you at every moment for making one wrong move. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And that's something that we really want. Because the way that I look at it, this in a lot of ways is um, so many so many exploration games um, are also like dubbed as walking simulators. And, mm-hmm. and partially the way that I look at this is essentially a walking simulator mm-hmm. in a plane okay. um, with a really cool different vehicle both for narrative and actually literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by having something in which uh, you, you had to constantly make sure that you your, your, your turning was correct so that you weren't dipping or raising up or that if you got too close to a wall and you're moving too fast then it ruined the experience of being able to look around and observe your environment that I think that would kind of um, go against what we were trying to do. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, So another question I have actually is about the world itself. Um, So it's an inverted planet, um, kind of like a bubble world, I guess. Um, I I imagine that you're going to be able to like, because it's about exploration, people can sort of fly any way they want at any given time. And the fact that it's inverted, you don't have to fly around the world to get to something. You can just like look straight up and then sort of veer toward where you want to go next. Um, how big is the world, and like how how long would you say it takes, for instance, to like fly from one end of it to the other, or do you plan to have like kind of semi instanced things where like you have to load up into a new um, area if you want to go into the next place? Hmm. So we do we, we do have instant spheres. So we have a few planets mm-hmm. that are separate from each other, okay. um, partially just because we want the world to be a bit larger than we can necessarily load in one go. Gotcha. So um, I think the plan right now is that there's one large central bubble. There's two attached ones, and then we'll add a third if we can. Mm-hmm. Um, we've sort of scoped out the third one, but also it'll probably be one of the stretch goals that we'll have is that we'll add a third environment. Gotcha. Um, that being said, as far as the point A to point B uh, size of the planets, it's a little hard to tell. I, I actually even have a reference sheet for like scale, mm-hmm. um, but because so much of the game still needs balancing, mm-hmm. like how fast the plane's going, right. it's a little hard to say that it takes like 10 minutes to fly from point A to point B. Okay. Um, but at the same time, I do know that if it takes you more than a minute mm-hmm. to get from one side of the sphere to a part that you want to get to, mm-hmm. if you're just sitting there holding down the gas button for like a minute, yeah. it's going to get boring sure. really fast. Sure. We don't have mm-hmm. the Dear Esther excuse of having a narrator tell you something while you're doing this. You right, know? Right. We don't have the excuse in Gone Home where it's sort of suspense and then mm-hmm. thinking about the things you've just digested or the things you've just read mm-hmm. or you know, reading the environment. Because the idea is it's, it's really open. So mm-hmm. you can see where you want to go, mm-hmm. and you're going to stare at it until you get there. <laughs> gotcha. So um, and one of the things that we're sort of experimenting with to solve that is actually a form of warping. Mm-hmm. So like uh, mm-hmm. you can sort of, if you actually look at the header of our website, you, you'll see that we have these gateways, and the plane can fly through, and you sort of get this like super hyper speed, you mm-hmm. know, this blue you know, glowing beam of light is uh-huh. trailing behind you. You're going crazy fast. Mm-hmm. And we want to come up with like a cool way to make getting from point A to point B interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually just about to suggest if you hadn't already thought of it, it seems you have, um, having kind of like the hyper speed yeah. segment where it's like, okay, now it's just like I'm trying to get from this far off point to this other far off point. Let's go super fast. Um, they, they did that in uh, Freelancer. Um, if you guys have ever played that, it was like an older PC game. Um, it's a space flight game. Um, and what you do is if you're trying to get to a far off planet or something like that, they have these like little warp gates um, that would speed you up. And it was kind of like a rail. Um, so it still mm. took longer than probably what you guys would be comfortable with, but it was meant to be kind of like this hu- huge, expansive thing. So they were kind of like okay with you taking five minutes to fly from right. place to place. Mm. Um, but they did have ways to speed up the process, yeah. you know, across the larger distance. And, and I do think I do think like at reality I say a minute, but mm-hmm. there's gonna be times like if you want to go from one like the North Pole to the South Pole and you're mm-hmm. literally flying the entire distance of the planet, uh-huh. yeah. Unless you're using warp time, it, mm-hmm. it's gonna take you a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to make sure that something as simple as you know I said this earlier is that chasing a rabbit for 30 minutes in Proteus was entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to do something similar with that. Where if you're flying from point A to point B for five minutes because the planet's that big. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I want there to be like flocks of birds that are flying around you, and sure. these little, this little small interaction that you sort of have. And it's um, and an example. We even just had a blog post about things that we like in exploration games, sort of. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones I mentioned was a uh, Demon Souls um, in the Tower of Latria. There's these uh, worshippers, these little like followers that you get. Mm-hmm. Um, you release them from prison, and they follow you on, and they start worshiping you. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's sort of hilarious, and it's sort of a small thing they added in that was unnecessary. Mm-hmm. But when you look at like making these sizes, these vast expanses interesting. Mm-hmm. 
uh, having a small interaction that is very entertaining, even if it's not very significant, is a really cool way of you know buffering that experience. Um, that being said, I guess I'm sort of skirting the question of how big are the planets. Mm -hmm. um, there's these huge towers you can see in the trailer which have houses attached to them. Um, mm -hmm. If you imagine, if you look at these little houses attached to it, you can see little doors on them. So mm -hmm. you can already see how huge these towers are. Okay. And then you realize like those towers aren't even reaching the center of the planet. Mm -hmm. So like the radius of the planet is like three times that. So it, it, it's, it's intentionally a very large scale. Yes, it's yes. very large. Okay, cool. Uh, that being said, the, the secondary ones you go to are probably going to get a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. which are going to be a bit more manageable. That's fine. Um, yeah. But we do want, because it's an exploration game, there needs to be stuff to go find, mm -hmm. you know. So if, you know, seeing the entire area takes a few seconds, you know, it, it's sort of it defeats sort of the lost. purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um, a good example might be uh, Banjo-Kazooie, mm -hmm. even, is that they sort of have these large areas that you're supposed to explore, and then each different area has its own little thing to do that keeps that area entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, and then because they're sort of entertaining of themselves within the entire area, it's just sort of getting from like this entertaining area to this entertaining area is just as simple as just walking between them, and then it's sort of instantly entertaining again. Mm -hmm. So our, our goal would be that there is no just empty space, and that we want sort of, sort of everything to be for sort of full of entertainment. Awesome. Um, that being said, we'll make the planets, and this might sound like a, a bad design philosophy, mm -hmm. we're going to make these planets as small as physically possible. Right. Because we want them to be as full of joy and entertainment as possible. Gotcha. Some people want gotcha. to say bigger, 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 yeah. but like we don't want it to be like, like if you took like World of Warcraft and mm -hmm. tried to turn that into an exploration game, mm -hmm. like without fighting anything, that's just boring. Like yeah, you're just <laughs> like, oh look, it's dark here. And Baron's then, chat. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, exactly. Right. Uh, so you want it to be densely packed with a lot of like rich, interesting things that are yes. in the environment. Yeah. It's, essentially. Yeah. It's it's very core philosophy to us that we will make our game as short as possible to make sure that it's as fun as it can be, because we we do believe that it doesn't matter. If the game was only 30 minutes long, our game will definitely be longer than that, though. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's the best 30 minutes of that genre you've ever played, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you just paid 20 bucks for it. Mm -hmm. I, I think Journey's a great example of that. Journey was like, what, 15 or 20 bucks at launch? I think it mm -hmm. depends if you have mm -hmm. PS Plus, whatever. Um, that game was, what, two hours, I think? I haven't played Journey yet, yeah. actually. Yeah. <sighs> Which I know, I, know yeah. I keep getting. <laughs> like, I, I, I with a lot of stuff, but it's. It, it, it's on my it's game fly queue. It's, yeah. it's coming. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, Journey is like a two hour game, which by most standards is extremely short. It's very especially short. Especially like, yeah. a buddy of mine plays JRPGs. You know, he's used to a game taking 50 hours to beat, you mm. know? But there's, so. some, there's some games, and I imagine Journey's one of them. I've played other games from that developer, so I sort of know how they that how they work. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they're very much about making it just as long as it needs to be. Be. Right. I find that by the time you get to the end of that game, it's kind of like, okay, I'm satisfied with this experience. Let's have a nice culmination, and I'm, yeah. it's a nice package. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like those games necessarily need to be, um, you know, 15 to 60 hours or whatever. Oh yeah, I agree. So, and um, mm -hmm. so it'll be as long as it needs to be. Cool. I, I think our goal is definitely going to be above two hours, and I think that's pretty easy for us to achieve. Um, I actually don't even think we're too far off from that in the near future. Is is that two hours with all of the exploration, or is that two hours if you just try to go straight to the end? Um, I, I would imagine that if you play through the game from start to finish, we're going to see something like an hour and a half, maybe, maybe two hours. Um, it's always hard to tell. Like, um, I, I did a little student project here, Shroud, and I, th I thought the game would take about 15 minutes to play through. It took me five minutes to beat the game, you know, and then I realized people were playing this thing for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you know. This thing I've, at longest I thought it was going to be 15 minutes is twice as long as that. And mm -hmm. then some people are faster. Some people right off the bat were almost as quick as I was. Right. Um, so I do think it's really hard. Like I say, Journey was, was a pretty easy out. It's pretty easy to say two hours for Journey. I, I might just be off on that. But because it's a fairly linear game, mm -hmm. it's a game that you know, you sort of know where you're going. There's never really a point in journey, maybe one where you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. It's sort of you see in the thing in the distance, you know where you're going. You know, you you there's one way to go. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of variability. You sort of have your character walks as fast and you're going from here to here. You know, that's how long it takes to get from there to there. Right. Unless you just fail three times, but even mm -hmm. then it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But for us it's hard because it, it even even with just just ignoring all the exploration it's much more variable than that. It's not a platformer where you're going left to right and it, you have a walk speed. You know, mm -hmm. it it might take a player just longer to find the demigod and realize that it's there. So, sure, yeah. you know, I could throw out two hours right now, but for all I know, it's going to take six. So, mm -hmm. 
um, but then I might meet someone that did it in 30. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, it's a really tough thing to throw around. I think around. it partially depends on how much you get distracted as you go along. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, uh, you had brought up like Proteus, for example, and like you would see, um, I was explaining Proteus to a friend just a few days ago, and we were looking at screenshots, and he saw a picture of one of the castles, and he's like, okay, I think I kind of get the idea is that you're walking around an island, and then you see it, it like for an example, you see a castle in the distance, and then you want to go to that castle. Um, and yet, <laughs> when you play it, it's, it's amazing. You almost never reach it because suddenly something else catches your attention yeah. and you want to go to whatever that is. I think that we found, um, and part of the reason we've emphasized exploration so much is we found that for the most part, a lot of players like to explore and they and they like to be um, they like to be distracted, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, and so, like Tyler had mentioned, like as you're going along, there is suddenly like a flock of birds. It's really interesting. There's something else that will catch your attention. I know that's part of the way that I often like to try to play games myself. Is mm -hmm. I'm definitely not. Uh, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not a completionist. I don't try to get every reward and find every achievement. Sure. Um, but what I do is I do like to take my time. Um, okay. Uh, and so, like even in something. That is a, isn't necessarily even open world. Um, I guess it's not the best example, but even in something like Fable, mm. um, most people that will take, like, say, maybe 12 to 15 hours to get through, I can very easily spend 30 because I will just simply spend time um, role playing with my family and, and sure, um, going yeah. out and spending a lot of time just. Um, uh, interacting with the civilians in the towns, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the same type of experience that you could create within this game. So exactly mm -hmm. as Tyler said, is you could very easily probably get through this mm -hmm. rather quickly. Um, I, I think that a two-hour mark would probably be a good mark, um, but uh, I don't want to say if played right, but um, <laughs> just uh, but there it, it would be very easy to double or triple that. I, I'm I'm just waiting for when this thing gets made and you have all the speedrunners who like day one start like posting like. Ten minute finishes and stuff like that. Well, what was it? So, so like, how do you even do that? An endless debate that Tyra and I have is whether or not Gone Home is a good game. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite games of all time, and um, he beat it within ten minutes. Yeah, and it's uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's well, is it? It's it's like goes back to that whole you know argument too. You know, is it a game? What is a game? Mm. That whole concept too, because um, for me when I played it, I, I thought it was very interesting, but I would I would classify it more as like a a really interesting virtual space, like a virtual mm -hmm. environment. I didn't really get this the the same sort of. Um, I didn't really get the impression that I was playing a game so much as I was just exploring a virtual space. Yeah. And um, from Proteus, I get that same. And I have I have not played played Proteus, but from all the descriptions that you talk about, and I looked it up on Wikipedia while you all were talking as well. Um, it seems like the same sort of thing where it's it's really just a space that you're exploring, and it's not really um, not really trying to be a game. And this isn't mm -hmm. to put either of those uh, those experiences down and they have their own sort of merits to them. Um, but it seems like to differentiate from both of those, y'all are trying to have both the exploration of those experiences, but you also want to have um, the objectives and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the different stages, the final the, the final ending sort of, you know, accomplishment of a game space. So you have kind of both this virtual space to explore and you've got a game, which I find interesting. Yeah. And it's... I think it's an interesting um, balance we're walking right now. We're sort of seeing this expansion of, I think, what we define games as right now. Sure. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the sense that we're either adding new words like sandbox to start describing these new things, mm -hmm. or we're just sort of calling them all games, you know, and it's it, mm -hmm. it sort of turns into this like really crappy fight over semantics. Well, really especially fast. given recent events, which we won't get into now. No, but yeah. It's just, um, uh... <laughs> it, it, it becomes a, yeah. a crappy argument. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, whatever. yeah. Like, like um, I said, um, it's not about the merit, because I think that, um, you know, it can have equal merit regardless of what you yeah. call it. I think, you know, the whole what's in a name sort of concept kind yeah, of comes up. It doesn't really matter what you call it, yeah. um, but I do think it's important to point out that there is a difference um, between... A game that expects you expects it to mm -hmm. be all about the exploration, and one that expects it to be all about the objective mm -hmm. seeking, and y'all are kind of walking uh, that line, sort of in between, like right in the middle, and mm -hmm. that's what I find interesting. And it's it's like a it's like you know there's visual novels, which actually are, it's interesting to me is that sometimes visual novels are actually more games than something like Proteus because you can actually lose at a visual novel, yeah, mm -hmm. even that's though true. like if, if it's kind of like a very very sparse choose your own adventure yeah, kind of thing, yeah. And, you know, so it sort of it really depends. It's like I call Minecraft a sandbox, not a game, you mm. know, kind of thing. Um, I like wrote a paper about that. Back at Gone Home, though, like <laughs> what, what Eric was talking about was uh, for me in ten minutes is that I I like clicking on things. Mm -hmm. So right off the beginning of like Gone Home, I just start clicking on everything, and then I wind up like. 
pulling the like secret book in the bookshelf and then like stumbled into like, the <laughs> big finale of the game in like ten minutes. And yeah, just, like yeah, just just it's, ruins the reveal. Yeah, yeah. So, like it's I I have a hard time enjoying Gone Home because I saw the ending in ten right. minutes. You know, mm-hmm. and it's like I. It's nice to know though that they allow you to sort of stumble upon that secret book and not like forcing you to go through yeah, the rigmarole it, of it's cool. The book was always it really, there. It really yeah. was under your nose the whole time. Yeah, exactly. It's cool, but it did it did ruin it for me. Though, sure, yeah, sure. Which sucks. Fair so, enough. Because I love Proteus. I feel like I would have loved that game. Yeah. But then that happened. But but yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting. Is that I would actually even love it if inside of inner space there was a way that you could sort of understand the universe and what's going on collect all the collectibles and all the relics mm-hmm. and then stop playing and then still feel happy with mm-hmm. what you came to know in that game. Sure. In the sense that I do love the idea that although there is an ending to the game that it's not inherently what is most rewarding about the game. So mm-hmm. like you can get the ending right off the bat. You could you know you can speed run the game ten minutes, get to the ending. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing with Gone Home. Yeah. Is that I can get to that ending and then see this big finale. And you know, same thing with me is that I am entirely dissatisfied because I've I've seen this ending. And the idea is that your definition of what is fun for this game and what is entertaining uh, or what is you beating the game might be you just learning enough to be able to explain that. Mm -hmm. And for Gone Home to me, uh, I feel like that would have been a really awesome experience had I not felt as if the rest of the story was building up to that reveal. Mm -hmm. Mm Because if if there was that reveal inside of it, and then I, I couldn't explain it, and then I spent the whole time trying to figure out that explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting to me because you know I, I don't want to spoil. I really don't want to spoil it, but like it's something that I identify. I know what's happening in that finale. Right. But if I'd seen that in finale, and it was like 2001: Space Odyssey, and I just had no clue what just happened. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just like, I just got spoiled. But I'm really curious. You know, mm-hmm. same thing with like mm-hmm. 2001 for me. Is that like I I watched the end of that movie, no clue what happened, spent a whole day trying to figure it out. You know, kind <laughs> of thing. Is that I would really love it if. There's sort of this user-defined ending to the game that mm-hmm. it's you can get the ending, but it's all about learning enough to sort of actually say, "I feel like I've actually, you know, like with 2001, I've, I feel like I actually understand this movie now." Or okay. like if I'd taken the time and gone home to get the other things that I, I've actually taken the steps to understand this game now. Uh-huh. And to me, that's just like you know that light of the devil thing you know, I was talking about earlier. It's it's. It sounds experimental to me in a certain way, and it sounds interesting to me in a way that makes me want to make that game. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, to me, that's like a really key part. I think for us as a studio, is that we always want to make games that, beyond all else, we find interesting. Right. Because I realize that I play games. I think you guys are probably. It sounds like you guys are the exact same way. Mm-hmm. I don't like. I have a genre that I like the most, mm-hmm. but I play everything. Sure. Like exactly. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. A good example yeah. with you, Eric, is that like you played. Uh, was it Wonderful World? No. Uh, Flat oh, um, but what is that? Lovely Planet. Lovely Planet. Yeah, I love that game. Was, yeah, thank you for recommending. That. Absolutely. <laughs> is that like? I, I don't really have like a type. Like I don't play racing games. Like, or I do play racing games, but like I don't have a a genre that I just play. Sure. You know, yeah. We play anything that we deem interesting or mm-hmm. cool. Three sixty no scope. Beep, beep, beep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not the guys that own every single Call of Duty that's come out. Right. You know, and honestly, we're not really. And I, I would love it if those kind of guys played our game, but we're mm-hmm. not making this game for those kind of sure, guys. Sure. Is that? We're not flying game enthusiasts. We're right. just video game enthusiasts, mm-hmm. and we want to make Interspace because we think it's really cool. Cool. So you know, and it's I think like it's the same for you guys. Is mm-hmm. that like, like you don't see a flying game, you're not just like, oh, I love flying games. Yeah. I'm gonna buy Interspace. <laughs> I do love flying games. <laughs> I do love flying games too, but it's yeah. you know, it, it's it looks cool because it's interesting. Right. And, right. and mm-hmm. to me, it's like it's the same with horror games. Even like we we're talking about earlier, it's like Five Nights at Freddy's isn't necessarily like. I'm not like, oh, spooky horror game. Yeah, let's do it. It's mm-hmm. like when you explain the game mechanics of it, it's just interesting. Yeah. Right. It's just super cool. Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of what attracts us to games, I think. Awesome. So. And that's a great place to start wrapping up. So do we have any uh, closing comments from anyone? Any closing questions? Please give us money. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just about to get to that. So the uh, the game is Inner Space. It's on Kickstarter right now. We'll include links uh, when we post this up. Um, yes, please do go back them. Um, I think this project is worth making. And if any of you guys out there, I'm sure I know we have a lot of ATEC UTD listeners here, um, support your fellow starving game designers. <laughs> if, if, if some of us can make it, maybe I'll give the rest of us hope. So. <laughs> and so, also, I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to the you know, Polynight guys for coming out and joining us and oh, definitely, talking yes. about their project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, thank you very us. much for having us. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, to anybody, we're uh, we're very active on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody, please feel free to reach out. Um, I 
Tyler and I both, um, I know everybody on the team, um, all of us uh, love interacting with everybody and love answering questions. We love talking about ourselves and uh, <laughs> love talking with you guys. Um, and uh, so, yeah, please, please do reach out. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us, guys. Um, and thank you, listeners, for joining us for Backward Compatible Podcast number 14. Uh, I'm Chris, and for Jim, Eric, and Tyler, um, thanks for joining us. See you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your favorite scary games, and what makes them that way. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay compatible. One of my friends who told me the scariest game that he has ever played um, was Gone Home. Mm. And it was for the very reason that he didn't know anything going into that game, and he didn't know that actually in reality, nothing happens and that there isn't a ghost or anything <laughs> and so he was expecting it just looks like it's supposed to be yeah, on house. yeah exactly it, it totally see and it's a perfect setup for one right, um, right. because you go into the house and it's exactly how a scary movie would be set up is that the family is gone there is a mystery try to solve it uh-huh. and you just expect like and so i played it again from that from that from that person that perspective and it is um because uh, you spend the entire game by yourself